Harvey Carnegie, how are you doing, brother? I'm good, man. How are you? Very, very well. I'm really pleased that you've been able to join me today. I know you're off to Bali in a couple of days and uh, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to squeeze it in, but we've just about managed to do it. And uh, yeah, really, really happy to have you here. So thank you for joining me. No problem, man. Happy to be here. Good, good. So I'm going to keep the intro short and sweet for you because you've been on quite a journey. Four years ago, you owned a car garage. Last year, you did 4.8 million in revenue for your e-commerce store. And this year, you're projected to do 20 mil. That's the plan anyway. So that's a wild transition in a four year period. I think most people don't even achieve that in a lifetime and you've managed to squeeze it in four years. Now, I was looking online yesterday and I managed to find an interview you did in the past with Alex Fedotov. And I think that's the last or maybe the only thing that you've ever done and kind of kind of publicly speaking. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. I have posted like one or two things on Twitter. Apart from that, pretty much silence for me. So unless people have seen that video with Alex, they don't, or they're a close friend, they don't really know your story. Yeah. So I know your story now, having watched that interview and kind of spoken to you about it. And I only know up until the point of December 2022, which was when you did the interview. So even the whole 18 months past that, apart from what you told me in the coffee shop the other day, there's probably so much that people don't even know. I don't even know half of it, you know, only sort of like the hour that we squeezed in the other day. But having watched that interview with Alex and you talk about your journey and how you transitioned from the car garage into dropshipping, into e-commerce, and that COVID was kind of a gateway to do that, I was able to take in kind of the ups and the downs of your journey, how many different businesses you had on the way, some of the challenges you faced. Um, and I'd love, if you don't mind, for you to kind of just recap on that, take it back to maybe 2020 where it all started in, in that car garage and how you first transitioned into the online space and then just what that journey's been like, really kind of honing in on the different businesses, but also maybe some of them like head in hand moments, because I know there was a few of them. 100% man, yeah. So back in 2020, I had like a car garage. We did like vinyl wrapping, window tinting. It was going okay. But then obviously COVID happened and like everything was shut down. You know, there was no way we could have kept going. So I had a lot of time to kind of think about what am I going to do? At the time we got paid off the government, now it was like, absolutely nothing but we still had time you know um so i was thinking what am i going to do here and we would already thought about doing like a, a mobile valley business where we'd have like a, you know a little van we drive it around we'd have a little van and we drive it around and go to the people's work and stuff like that for people that are busy and we'd you know valet their cars and i was thinking okay because i was already spending so much time doing the actual service and all that so the whole idea was, okay, we'll get it going. We'll get someone in the van that removes me from the van. Then we get another van, we get someone else in it. So I was already kind of thinking about like, how can I remove myself from doing all the work? So going into COVID, I was kind of looking into this a bit more and seeing like, okay, how can I market this? So I was looking up on YouTube marketing stuff and of course got hit with like a drop shipping ad. Mm. I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. So like, then I got more into it. I was looking into all of this and I could see all these kids that seemed to be making like hundreds of thousands a month. And I was like, this looks great. So I was at a point, I remember talking to my ma about it, being like, I don't know what to do. You know, I could go, I know I'll make either one of these work, but I don't know. I've no experience in any kind of marketing or anything like that, you know? So I had the time and I just watched tons of YouTube videos and I was like, look, this is pulling me. This, this is the one I want to go for. So just kept consuming tons of content, opened up a Shopify store, was doing like all the typical stuff, you know, spending hours a day watching like tons of different YouTubers. Um, and eventually like just tested a bunch of products just from the same product, the same ways that everyone's saying on, on YouTube to do. So we were testing all sorts like, you know, LED dog collars, these necklace things, all just like terrible yeah. products, but that's what was being shown on YouTube, you know? So I think I spent probably the first two months just testing stuff out with absolutely, I didn't even get a sale. I remember the first sale I got was for this, um, it was like a, what's it called? A star sign necklace. Okay. So it was like, you know, it's Sagittarius, all these different ones. Yeah. And I think the product cost 20 cents and I had it on, on the website for maybe $9 or something like that. I think I spent $500 and got one sale. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was slow starting. It definitely wasn't like super successful straight away. Um, and then the first product that we got to actually generate some revenue was this. It was like a, a toothbrush for kids and it's like a U and you pop it in their mouth and it just like meant to clean their teeth. So had that go, we did about 30K revenue over... I think a month, which back then it was like, holy shit, yeah. this is working. Um, but eventually the Shopify store just got shut down. No idea why. Um, and actually what happened was we hadn't fulfilled orders. 
So we had a whole headache with Stripe then. So the Shopify store got sit, shut down. We had probably 30 orders that weren't fulfilled and we couldn't even get access to them. So that was a headache. Um, but just kept going. The next thing we had was, it was like a training toilet seat that sat on a toilet and we actually ran it up. We, the supplier said we could actually sell it. Got, again, I don't know how much revenue we did, maybe 30K or something mm -hmm. like that. Again, back then I was thinking, okay, this is the second time I've been able to do this. So we got that to work. Then the supplier went, oh, actually, by the way, that's the, the wrong price for shipping that I told you. So because this product was, it basically was like a toilet seat that sits on top of a toilet seat with a little ladder on it. And it was too expensive to ship. And I'd already done, you know, a decent amount of revenue mm. at this stage. Maybe it was less, could have been 17, 18K, I don't know. But anyway, so I ended up having to fulfill these, because we were shipping to Australia, USA, Canada, UK, I had to go onto all the different Amazon sites to try and fulfill the orders <laughs> from Amazon. So again, that's how we got past that. Shut the store down, obviously, because it wasn't feasible to keep going like that. And then the first real, like, actual successful one where I had actual profit in the bank was, it was COVID and I just did image ads of these slippers. And from day one, it was like, you know, four or five row ads. I was like, holy shit, this is super easy. Because they were just images of the slipper, basic, basic product page. And we were only doing targeting Ireland. Yeah. And what we did was once we had that bit of success, because the shipping times are so bad in China, we were ordering boxes and boxes of this stock to my friend's warehouse. He has his own business in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I was actually in there picking and packing orders like for hours. I was doing customer support. I was doing everything like working probably like, I don't know, 14, 15 hour days doing this. And now the profit was decent. So I think the margins were probably 50% or something like that because we were ordering in bulk. Yeah. This, I, I remember looking back in this ad account like probably a year ago and the CPMs were something like $5 or something like that. Yeah. So like we didn't even need to know what we were doing. It was just the traffic was so cheap, you know. So we ran that for a good while and eventually I was just had a headache. I did get a customer support VA to take over. Um, and then, yeah, we, we were just looking at it. I was like, I can't keep fulfilling these, you know what I mean? And when we were importing them, it was kind of, if we were to start hiring people to pick and pack, we would have to start looking at VAT and all. I hadn't even got a company set up at this stage for this stuff. Um, so I started shipping from China again. And then what happened was the shipping times were slower, the product quality decreased. And then, you know, Ireland's a small place. So once you kind of have, it, it's really easy to get a brand going because it's mm. so small. As soon as you get traction, everybody knows about it. But as soon as it had a bad name, everybody knew about it. So that yeah. kind of fizzled out. But it gave me a decent amount of cash flow to move on to the next thing. Um, and again, it, it proved in my head, you know, this model works and I can keep going at it. Again, hadn't got a ton of revenue generated over that space, but it, it was only probably six months since starting. So it was nice, yeah. you know. And then that was leading into Q4, where we first hit our proper big winner for big winner for back then. We did 250K over that quarter, um, which for me was like, okay, sick. This, yeah. is, this is crazy, you know. Again, our margins are pretty good. CPMs back then were super low. Um, and that Q4 did 250k, thought it was a baller, and then moved, <laughs> moved out here to Dubai. <laughs> I mean, so even that that first segment there is you is what would that what kind of period would that be? Would that be over like six months? That was the first or? year. So, so the first so. six months, like I, I lost probably 5k before even like I, like I didn't even break even on that 5k probably till halfway through Q3. I'd say, yeah, you but know, even in that, how much the the amount that you learned must have been insane, like running ads, getting stores set up. Bear in mind, you did all of this yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And at this point, it was purely from just watching YouTube videos or had you invested in any kind of courses yet? Not yet. So, man, the way I've worked, like I've done a ton of different things. Like yeah. I've, I've been a scuba instructor. I've done, <laughs> I was a DJ and I, I've always learned everything on YouTube, like yeah. everything on YouTube. And I love learning. So like when I was in COVID and in quarantine, basically couldn't even leave the house. So instead of look, looking just at these e-com videos, I was like, okay, I need to know how to make graphics. So I did mm -hmm. a Photoshop course. Okay, I need to help, know how to edit videos. I did a Premiere Pro course. So I did a ton of different courses that were outside of e-commerce, but directly helped in the business. Yeah. So I had learned a ton of skills. Yeah. Um, the Facebook ad side things were just from, you know, gurus on YouTube. So I had learned all these skills. And then it was actually around the time of that slipper store, I bought a guy called Kim, King Com, his course. He was only a young guy and he seemed to be crushing it. He's actually dead now. Um, but his course, I think it was like $500 or something like that. But his course was really set us up for the Q4 store. It was like a really easy approach to building the store, keeping it simple. Like the designs of the store were like, you know, one color, just really basic stuff. And that kind of led us into that Q4, which allowed us to generate all the profits. Yeah. So even in that first year, you've been through a lot. So that there was 
four different stores. Yeah. Oh, one. no, there was There's more. They were just the ones that worked. There was, <laughs> I'd say, bro, I'd say there was probably 30 or 40 different stores. And the thing about it was I was like a perfectionist. I didn't want to do this general store stuff, right? So what I did was I built a new Shopify store every time, yeah. which took forever. Like it took me probably a week to build this from scratch, make a new logo rather yeah, than just, yeah. you know, test the product. But I thought, no, this has to be perfect. It has to look like a real brand. Yeah, so new domains, new Shopify new domains, stores, new, Shopify stores, new, new research, new, new PayPal product. accounts every time. Why new PayPal? Because I just thought it has to have the same email. Oh, got you, got you. So you were taking payments through obviously Stripe and PayPal. Yeah, Shopify payments and PayPal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So th about 30, 30 different stores. Yeah, easy. And that's in one year. Yeah. And then by the end of that, you were able to do 250K in Q4. So by the sound of things, well deserved. It didn't come easy and you even had some difficulties along the way. Did you say up until Q4 as well, you were actually at like a 5K loss from so all I, those? I, I lost about 5K on the first couple of things. And then yeah. even in between the successes, there was failed stores that had burnt money. You know what I mean? So up until probably halfway through Q3, I was still down. So yeah. towards the end of Q3, I had actually started to make a bit of profit. And then obviously Q4 came and I was like, okay, from that we probably had 60K profit in the bank yeah. realized. And I was like, okay, wow, well, this is sick. Yeah. I think there's probably some people that spend a year thinking about a business name and a logo and you've had 30 or 40 different stores in that time. So there you go. Like, I think maybe a lot of people take way too much time on the small intricacies where you said halfway through you didn't even have a business set up yet you're just kind of launching these stores getting them up and running doing the market research rebuilding the stores each time becoming a perfectionist learning your craft i think that's the thing that most people don't realize with ecom is you have to wear so many different hats like it's not just ecom and we'll get into it in a moment where you kind of talk about copyright and things like that but unless you hire specialists at each of these things which no one can do at the beginning when you're a new store unless you've had investment or funding but you know, if you're just drop shipping or selling someone else's product, I don't know how likely it is you'll get that. So you've got to learn, you know, website design, web store build, ads, copywriting, email marketing, content, just everything that involves running a store, payment processing, customer support, customer services, like the list does go on. So I often say, I think e-com is a great entry to just exposing yourself to a number of different high income skills. Because individually, all of these are high income skills. You know, all of them. Or well, you've learned all of them in the space of a year and that's just your, your first year. Yeah, man, this is what we were saying in the coffee shop the other day. Yeah. Like, if a beginner reaches out to me now, I'm like, I genuinely don't know where to start because back then CPMs were so cheap so you could get yeah. away with shit marketing and not the best stuff and people weren't as exposed. Everyone was saying it was like saturated back then. But now it's like, not that it's saturated, that you can still make a ton of money in it, but the quality of everything has to be a lot better. You yeah. know what I mean? So like back then I did learn all them and I did hold on to a lot of them for too long because mm. like you know at the start we had that success but like you can't be a master of all these skills you know you need video editors that are just video editors because yeah. they're going to blow you out of the water you know if you're not a video editor but at the start as you said it is great to even just build up all these skills and if there's one you're particularly good at or particularly enjoy and then e-commerce isn't for you you can put yourself in a position where you can join any other business yeah yeah 100 percent. well that's exactly what i did mine was a slightly different journey to yours in that mine was high ticket drop shipping using local suppliers in the UK. And I did exactly what you did. I held on for it for too long. It was like my baby. Like I'd spend every single day working on it, building it. A bit of a perfectionist like yourself, like set up this, this uh, email flow, change this description, try and push this product more, tweak this ad, reduce this CPM. Like everything was just like, I would just dip in, in, and, in and out of everything. Um, and I think I held on to that way too long, but then I did exactly what you just said and decided to go into marketing and paid ads specifically. Although I do I do have shiny ob object uh, syndrome, especially when we have conversations like this when I'm thinking about e-com, but I need to remind myself to just keep doing what I'm doing until I've uh, got the time. But um, so that's year one. And yep. then where did we go from there? So year two was much of the same, nearly, man. Like coming into Q1, um, I actually moved, it was actually the end of Q4, I actually moved out to Dubai. Um, thinking like, oh, I've got this figured out, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Got over here, had money in the bank. Um, and then the first week I was here was like, you know, it was just meeting up with people and getting settled in. And then kind of got to work. Um, like when I started this journey, like I was a completely different person. So I had first started doing kind of self-development stuff and built up some really good habits back home. And um, like, you know, I didn't drink, I was meditating, journaling. I was doing all this stuff that I was really dialed in. And when I got out here, I just made a, a decent amount of money and it's, you know what it's like out here, it's crazy. Yeah. So a lot of the habits that kind of got me to where I was kind of fell out the window quite quickly. Mm. Um, 
So that didn't help. And then another thing that happened was crypto was on an absolute bull run. So I had joined Discords, I bought a course and I yeah. thought I knew everything about crypto, <laughs> but everything was just going up. I just like, everything I was doing was working, you know? Yeah. So I started making like decent money with crypto, you know, someday, the biggest day we had was like 15K in a day, yeah. um, like generally one or 2K per day, 3K. So the e-com side of stuff, I was kind of not spending as much time on it. Anything I was launching, CPM was high and it was like, oh, CPM's too high. I don't know, something yeah. wrong with the account. And instead of actually keeping up learning new skills and kind of actually doing deep work and doing that sort of stuff. So a lot of that went on. Um, I didn't really, while I was over here, I only, maybe the biggest month I did was maybe 150K. Um, but like, you know, I had so much momentum for a Q4 that I think if I'd stayed put, I, yeah. I'd be in a much better position now because I think I would have just been still dialed in. I would have kept all the good habits that I had and, you know, just really focused on actually what I want to do, which is the e-commerce. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, that's what happened. I was over here, was making money with crypto. The e-com stuff kind of fell aside. And then I actually traveled to Cyprus with a friend of mine um, and I got off the plane and I'd lost 34 grand in crypto. I was like, what's going on? So then yeah. I was, we were there for a week and I was like, okay, look, it's going to come back up. I think I lost another 30K or something while I was over there. And then I was traveling home to Ireland and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But you know what? It was a good thing because it was like, I have to get back to doing the econ thing. So I got home, dialed in. And from there, we started having some good success again. We had um, started actually a couple of different stores. One of them we had was a candle brand, um, which basically was in Ireland. We had a we manufactured them in Ireland. They were like gemstone candles. Mm -hmm. So we had them manufactured and we actually month one produced or did so many sales that they couldn't keep up with the demand. So a friend of mine, we, we partnered up on this business and a friend, the same friend who I was shipping the slippers out of, yeah. he had a, a warehouse. So he was actually overnight melting candle wax. <laughs> he had all the scents, putting the gemstone, like it was crazy. <laughs> I still have videos on my phone, man. It was a crazy operation, but we just couldn't keep up with it, man. I yeah. think the first month we did 100K euros and the margins were insane. Um, and again, that was leading on to Q4 the following year where we, we crushed it. I think that year we did like, or that Q4, we did like a million dollars. Um, and the rest of the year, I'd say we maybe generated 600K across the whole year. You know what I mean? So Q4, you did a million and then Q1 to three, you also did 600K. So that was maybe total 1.6, Yeah, say? total revenue, yeah. So that's your second year in, in e-commerce. Yeah, but that year was hectic. So because we had the crypto crash, then we had like, you know, a, a lot of struggle. When I get home, I skipped over a whole load of, of struggle phase where mm. I was trying to get back into the swing of things. Things were quite different on Facebook then as well. Like the CPMs were definitely higher. Um, I really started to realize like, I don't really know what's going on with creative. The whole time I was still learning a lot, you know. Um, and eventually what actually cracked at first was just focusing on how to make winning creatives in terms of kind of copywriting the scripts. Um, they were in no way like copywriting as I would see it now, but just focusing on the creative. Because before there was just any random like, yeah. you know, stock footage, stuff off YouTube. We started investing in kind of creators and that's what kind of got us profitable again. Um, then with that Q4, we were doing, I think like 30 or 40, no, sorry, that Q4, we were doing 20K per day. I don't know, did we actually do a million dollars that year? Um, because it's the same, this seasonal offer we run every year. So mm. this is, we just ran it last year as well. But anyway, that's, year we were doing I think about 20 25k per day and I hadn't got a US business or any other business set up it was just the business back in Ireland right so we lost our Stripe account while we we're doing this great margins and I was like oh my god what do I do here so I did I had no idea like what am I going to do here so reached out to a ton of different people they were like we can't get you any mids we can't do anything if you've got no US company set up um, and I was looking at it as like I'm losing 20k per day here mm. So ended up getting put in touch with this guy who was like, yeah, you can rent Stripe accounts from us. I was like, okay, sick. Okay, let's do this. So I rented a Stripe account. The deal was the person who I rented off got 10% of everything generated. So I was thinking, okay, look, we're, we were at like 40% margins. So I think, okay, this is a good deal. You know, it'll, it'll get yeah. us through Q4. Ran that. We did whatever it was, 600K or a million. I can't really remember. But basically at the end of the quarter, um, we were waiting to be paid out some. And it was like, Money never landed. I was texting this guy, don't worry, bro, it's going to come, it's going to come. And I was like, what's going on here? And I think there was like 250K he owed us and then he transferred 50K and then transferred, I think, another 50K. Anyway, what happened was we were left, we were burnt for 120K. Guy disappeared off the face of the planet, no money to be had. So the profits that we generated, you know, like if we did, I can't remember the revenue, but if it was, say, 600K, 
maybe we did, I don't know, maybe 200K, but 120 of it was gone. So yeah. what I thought was, you know, a big payday turned out to be just like, okay, f you know, this is this. And we still had to fulfill all the products. So not only did we get burnt for the 120K, but we had to pay to fulfill the products that he took the profits from, you know? That's crazy. And um, I think I've got to hand it to you because although we didn't touch on the mindset stuff, but it might be quite good just to, to share that because up until this point, it's been so many different tests and some worked better than others. Um, in between, you came out to Dubai, got blown away with the crypto bull run. I think <laughs> everyone does it. We, we all do it. You kind of got a little bit burnt there, but don't we all? I think that's how you learn. And then come back into e -com, struggled with maybe a little bit of mindset, which I think it might be quite good to touch on just because it's not all glory. And, I, and what you've just said there about getting burned and scammed by someone is just one small example, but maybe what would be quite relatable for everyone that's listening is the day-to-day -day struggles because there are so many. I know, I know, you know what the way I used to describe my econ business was an emotional roller coaster. That's how I would describe it to people. And where, I, being that I was from like a small seaside town, no one really did e-commerce then. I'm like, it's me and like you said, YouTube, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd talk to my mum about it a lot. She didn't really understand what I was going on about. Um, but those day-to-day -day struggles, they are difficult. Um, not only when you've got someone else scamming you for money at the end of Q4 as well. So there's been a lot of times where in the first year, the first sort of Q1, two and three, you're actually at a loss of 5K over a space of 30 or 40 stores. Q4, you did well, came out to Dubai, got into crypto, lost about 60, 70 K, then did well again in Q4, scaled that, got the Stripe account shut down. Someone's then scammed you. So there's been so many, exactly like I would say, an emotional roller coaster, extreme ups and then boom, back down, up and then back down. So how have you been able to, I guess it's a natural progression is probably the answer, but how have you been able to just overcome these things, mate? Because there's so many times where people would probably give up like yeah. there's so many setbacks obviously i'm guessing it's just your mentality but is there is there anything that like keeps that fire going yeah man i i suppose it like builds up over time if you had given me the struggle that i had at the end at the starts oh it would have crumbled you know what i mean but it's these day-to-day -day things that you're doing the stress your stress tolerance grows over time mm. you know so like the stress tolerance i have now like is a lot bigger than even last year and the same for the year before because you're you, the, the more revenue and the more other stuff that you're doing it, the more stress you're put under you acclimatize to it you know yeah so i suppose though i was looking at like what other options have i got i was kicked out of school and um, i had no other opportunities do you know what i mean it was just like i have to make this work there, there is nothing else what's the what's the alternative you know yeah um, and the way i look at things as well like i've always said like if someone else can do something i can do it like you know what i mean mm. so i looked at it like that um I, th I think that's that's pretty much it, man. Yeah. I think those setbacks sometimes are, uh, the way I would describe it, it's like a necessary evil. Yeah. Like, I almost sometimes think um, it's a test. Like, it's like, you know, you have that amazing Q4, just relating it back to your story, where you did, did you say a mill in Riven? I can't remember if that, I don't think that Riven. one was a mill. Okay, but did, did pretty well. Yeah. Would have turned over a lot. And then... It's like someone checks you, you know, you get that scam, you did nowhere near what you thought you were going to do, but then you go back to the drawing board, you do it all over again, and then the next time it's bigger, you know, and I, I think I used it, this analogy on another podcast, I often say like the snakes and ladders, like you get, you get that good run and then you hit a snake and it's like, no, 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 like back up again and you start working your way back up and it sounds like you had a lot of them. 100%, man. Like the way I look at it now is like, because even now we have a lot of tests where it's just like, oh man, I was telling you about one of them the other day, yeah. pretty big one. But like the way I look at it now is like all of these things have forced me to grow. And the way now when you have these setbacks, of course, initially the reaction is like, oh my God. But you just like, you have to look at it as like, this is an opportunity to grow, mm. you know? 100%. So we're now two years in. Yeah, this is where the fun stuff starts. So coming off the back of just being scammed, um, we still made decent money and we, like, we had some momentum and there was no crypto or anything like that. Yeah. So coming off the back of that, um, I got off to a good start in Q1 um, and then I went to... I went to Turkey and I got... I went over to Turkey with my missus and I got attacked and put in hospital over in, in Istanbul. So mm -hmm. I was in bits. That was January, just after being scammed. 
Then PayPal held. Um, oh, oh, yeah, but wait, what, 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 what happened there? This was a January. We were just out. We went to Istanbul. Yeah. And we were just out in, we were out drinking. And at the end of the night, my missus went in to get our bag and then came back out and I was being kicked in the face by about six, about six lads. So that was a, a good time. And then also got home and PayPal had, this is why we don't use PayPal anymore. PayPal had debited, I think, like 32K from our account. Um, so that was, we had the 120K loss and then this PayPal one as well. So that was the start of the year. And I was just thinking, oh my God, here we go again. That was tough because we had, I just got over the initial, you know, December stuff. And then this is how January started. But again, got over pretty quickly, to be honest. Um, I was like, this is just just part of it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So was launching stuff, everything was seemingly going well, like we were generating consistent kind of profits. It was good. Um, and then we moved to Marbella, which is great. It was really nice to kind of get out of Ireland again. Um, you know, I left the boy and the plan was never to be in Ireland anyway. So left Ireland, went to Spain, which was really nice. Um, and we were generating some money. And then the iOS update and happened around that time. So stuff started to get a bit shaky. I think it did for everyone. Um, and again, we had those on and off months, you know, some months we do 200K, next month is 50K, next month, do you know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. these, these crazy ups and downs. Um, and I was just thinking like, I had actually met a good friend, you know, Jordan, you've met him too. I met a good friend over there. I'd known him through Instagram uh, and we linked up. He was in Marbella too. And I remember showing him these advertorials. I, there was very few people I knew talking about them. There was a guy who was in Alex's program, Paul Nicholas, and I heard him talking about them in an interview with Alex. Mm. I started looking into these and I was like, man, I, these, these are crazy. I remember sitting at the desk with Jordan being like, look at these, like these are crazy. So I was like, okay, I have to learn this. And mm. um, this is because we're just so inconsistent. And the other thing is, like before I learned all this stuff, I didn't know why anything was working. It was literally throwing shit at the wall. You know, you're picking a product because it's trending or it's popular or it solves a problem. And then the video ads you're making are just like, you don't really know what you're doing. If something works, you don't know why. So I was like, I have to kind of reevaluate this. We had consistent profits and it was fine. So I wasn't like struggling for money. So I actually stopped launching stuff. Um, and at the time there was always people reaching out to me saying like, can you run ads? Can you do this? So I took on a couple of ads clients just to cover rent, stuff like that. I had three clients back then. Funnily enough, one of them was a candle brand. Um, and I was thinking, okay, so I got into the advertorials and I took the Stefan Georgiou or NBC method course. And again, like went through that, but of course, like you can read a textbook. It's like learning a language. You know what I mean? If you learn, read a French textbook on how to learn French, you're not gonna be able to speak French. If you actually immerse yourself in France, you can learn a lot quicker. So yeah. I was reading tons of advertorials. I joined up a lot of affiliate networks just to see what advertorials they had on the networks uh, in all spy tools, native ad spy tools, because that's where the most advertorials were at the time. Um, I was just reading them and just like seeing and like writing down the structure and what, what is this headline? And I was just testing stuff, but with this candle brand was the first advertorial I got to kick off. Um, and they were struggling big time. They were doing like, think like a 0.8 ROAS. Mm. This guy had actually just bought, he had a big, it was the guy who manufactured our candle brand the last time, had purchased a candle brand. And they had a ton of stock, but the ads sucked. I jumped in, I was like, oh my God, this is shocking. Yeah. No matter what we did, we couldn't get them <clears> profitable. <throat> Wrote the advertorial for them. First one sucked, second one, went from like a 0.8 row as they were like a six row as they were they were printing with it um and then i was like okay i wrote another one for a different brand and that worked too um now there could have been luck but in my head i was like okay this is it i gave up doing ads for them and i launched my next thing was in the beauty space yeah. and that just took off with the advertorials like everything we launched was just profitable we were at 60 percent margins we scaled up to like 7K per day within the first two weeks. Like it was just, it was crazy. Yeah. And that was like for me, like light bulb moment where I was like, okay, this is what I have to focus on now. Yeah. So just to break that down for people that don't know, an advertorial, um, you can probably explain it better than I can, but it's essentially an ad that's made to look like an editorial, right? So it's very much text-based. Yeah. So it depends again, who you're writing to. Like um, you have to think about how the customer you're targeting consumes information someone who's 30 or someone who's 25, 25 year old female, they might look more like a Buzzfeed style, you know, article that's like, you want to match that to what they are consuming daily anyway. So for an older demographic, you know, they probably read the newspaper, you want to match that. But basically what it is, it's a pre-sale page. It's a step between the product page and your ad. 
Uh, the whole idea with it is to basically sell them without they know, them knowing they're being sold to, you know, because there's a lot of, as soon as someone sees product and a price, they're like, they have an objection and they're kind of like can bounce. Whereas this way you can walk them through the process, tell them about all the benefits without their kind of walls being up to being sold to. There's a couple of different types. There's a, you can do story based ones. You can do like breaking news ones. There's listicles, like 10 reasons why, but basically it's just a step between your ad and the product page. Yeah. So let's run them through a scenario then you've got a meta ad mm -hmm. and say someone's seen that ad they've then clicked on the ad it takes them to a landing page which is not a shopify page or a product page it's an advertorial mm -hmm. which is where you're kind of doing the selling yep. and that's built depending or, or built to suit the target demographic from that point they then have the option to click through to the shopify page or the landing page product page where they should by that point be ready to purchase so that's that's the setup in its simplest form yeah basically so it's like you know you're warming up the traffic almost so when they yeah. by the time they hit the product page they're a lot warmer than your initial if you're just drive a traffic a drive traffic from facebook right to a product page or a landing page you know it is cold traffic whereas this the traffic is a bit warmer yeah 100 percent. do you think that's why in some instances long form copy if you are going from ad straight to a product page can work better because you've got that opportunity to sell in the ad yeah, well, the thing about it you have to think is, <clears throat> like, you're creating intent to a long form. So with shorter form, like, we've done a ton of different um, types of ad copies. You can do really short clickbaity stuff, and you're going to get a higher CTR, but lower intent. So by the time they hit the product page, they're just curious. You mm -hmm. know, it's curiosity clicks. And it does work because you're looking at it, okay, we're getting cheaper clicks versus, like, higher priced clicks, but more intent. So... The long form stuff when going to a product page is you're, you're building intent with that copy, you know what I mean? Rather than just like a short, snappy, clickbaity text. Yeah. So you talked about kind of tailoring it to the audience mm -hmm. earlier, which is a valid point. To someone that might say, well, you know, I don't know if anyone would say this, but the way I see it is now people indulge in, in so much content. Or if I'm just thinking about maybe other platforms like Meta and TikTok and how you said about how content has evolved, um, everything is like, not all the time, but like pretty well produced video style format. And if there doesn't have a strong hook within the first few seconds, people swipe and things like that. So would you say an advertorial you know, really does depend on the target demographic? Or do you think, no, you can still tailor the way in which the message is presented depending on the demographic in a way that suits that individual to still convert? I think it's very much like who you're writing to, you know what I mean? Like the the really long form stuff, if you look at any of the, like the Golden Hippo stuff, which is like a billion dollar company, they do tons of different long form stuff. It's all to older demographics. So their VSLs could be like 40 minutes long. This is an ad that's on Facebook being run. And then they might hit another advertorial and like they, they will consume that. Whereas someone who's like 18, 19 years old, they're not going to sit there and consume a 40 minute VSL. The same applies for your advertorial. You know what I mean? They're not going to sit there and read this huge text based looking thing. They're going to want something that there's GIFs there's a lot more imagery. You've got icons. You've got stuff to like, get the point across visually. Whereas if you think about someone who grew up years and years ago, someone in their 50s or 60s, a lot of these people still read newspapers mm. where it's black and white text with maybe black and white images, some of them. Uh, that That's how they consume yeah. content. You know what I mean? Whereas someone who's on TikTok scrolling all the time, they're looking for that quick dopamine hit and they need, if you're going to do an advertorial for them, which I have, I don't know, there probably is, but I don't know anyone really using advertorials on TikTok because they're in that short form mindset yeah. where if you then try to take them and bring them, show them this big text space thing, I don't think it's going to work as well. I'm sure there is people doing it, but for me, it doesn't make as much sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you do all of the copywriting for your ads yourself. Yep. So how do you tailor it in a way to speak to that individual what does the research look like i know you mentioned it comes down to who you're trying to talk to and you gave some examples there but if you're conducting research on your customer profile what would that process look like and how would you gear the copy to speak directly to them to convert yeah man this is the most important part and it's like when i first started it was the part that i was just like ah yeah look i know who i'm writing to but and even with ai and stuff you can speed up the research process but actually i feel like you shouldn't at the start because like I could spend a day or two days just doing research before I do any writing. Mm. I will go onto Amazon, I'll export all the reviews, 
and I'll actually read through all the reviews and watch like Amazon is a gold mine. You'll people who leave, especially with pain relief or skincare, they'll leave these golden nugget reviews and you can nearly write a whole advertorial based off of this. But we'll keep all them um, and we'll go through and like if there's a certain word like arthritis or something that's been used, we'll have arthritis there. And then every time we see the word arthritis, I'll just say one, two, three. So at the end, you have a word count. Like, okay, this word keeps popping up. You want to write to them in the language that they use. And that's how you'll go through Amazon. You can see the language that they use. Reddit is another goldmine. Absolutely amazing source for skincare, pain relief, any sort of niche. They have Reddit, tons, tons of personal stories. You want to read all of this and keep it. You want to document it and keep it in a really um, organized way. Because when I first started doing it, it was a Google Doc and I pasted everything in. And I mm. couldn't find anything. Keep it really, really organized. Because the benefits of this, now when we write advertorials, they're so much quicker because... We have all of this research done already and you have might have really interesting parts where you can just pull chunk. It's like building Lego, you know what I mean? Okay, yeah. this is the mechanism of the problem. We just pop that in there. But Reddit is really good. Another really good source is actually, depending on the product you're selling, for example, um, back pain or sciatica, let's say, you can join Facebook groups that is full of people with sciatica. And what are they posting in there? They're posting in their daily struggles, how they speak about it, what other solutions they've tried. A lot of them post in, hey, has anyone tried Volterol gel for blah, blah, blah? And then they'll get people's opinions on this. So you really get to understand who you're writing to then. You can even on Facebook, click into these people's profiles. Have a look at, like, are they overweight? Is it mainly men? Is it mainly female? What sort of age do they look? You can get so much information. And when you have all of this, if you use AI, you can get all of the information, but you don't really absorb it. You know what I mean? Whereas if you're going through this hours and hours of work yourself, you really understand who you're writing to. You can you can see them in your mind. So it makes it that much easier when writing the copy. 100%. I think it gives you the time to actually process it, like you've said, and digest it. And I think that is true. You, If you do it yourself, you actually digest it and you learn. Otherwise, if you're just taking what AI is telling you to be true, first of all, you don't really know how accurate it is. I mean, we all assume it's accurate, but we've all read ChatGPT and I know the way that it writes and it, you can always tell it's it's AI. So even if you did use it as a base, I guess you'd still need to understand it enough to tweak it to be able to write it like in a, way, sorry, in a format that your target demographic are going to understand. You know, yeah. So I think that's key is actually doing the research and then building out the ads. I think there's probably a lot of people out there using uh, Chat GPT and posting it and going, "Oh no, it doesn't work," or "That angle doesn't work." I've tried it when actually they're just maybe not presenting it in a way that the audience is going to understand. Yeah, one hundred percent, man. And like the thing is, once you've done this research, fire away. Use Chat GPT because it's we use it for so much and it is unbelievable. It's really, really good. There's some guys like Stefan Georgiou, the guy who did that RMBC method. They're coming up with some crazy stuff. They're writing like full long, long form VSLs, 80% using AI. It's crazy. Really? But once you've got that information, that's when you feed that information into ChatGPT to come up with interesting hooks or interesting ways to structure it. Like the other stuff you have to come up with when writing your copy is like the mechanism of the problem. So what what is the reason for the problem that they're having? Um, and you can use ChatGPT to come up with cool names for mechanisms and also see if it's a supplement, for example, it contains th these three uh, ingredients in your supplement. You can actually see, do these, do, these three sup uh, do these three ingredients actually help solve that problem? You know what I mean? Mm. So that you can use it for all sorts of stuff like that. But initially, that research, I think, has to be done by you so you understand. Yeah, 100%. So we've talked a lot about advertorials and your method, which I really appreciate you sharing. Is that the only form of ad that you will tend to run? Or do you also have other ads running for your particular business that is in the pain relief niche? So when we start, say if we launch a new product or we're initially launching, we don't actually use an advertorial first of all. And we don't, like we normally do VSLs anywhere from three to 20 minutes long. But that's not how we start because there's a lot of um, effort to put in for something that's not proven. So what we initially do is we will come up with, we do the research, like I told you, and we build out this like three different angles, three different avatars, and we build like an angle avatar matrix. So one angle could be a gifting angle, another one could be avoiding surgery, another one could be whatever. And then we have our avatars. So it's like, you know, an active older lady, um, it could be a nurse. And then we just basically a matrix with them that gives us nine different ads. Each ads will come with different hooks. So you've got nine different ads that you're testing across different avatars and different angles. And then we send them to the sales page, sales page, like a product page. Um, and on there, we'll keep the messaging super broad. It's not really targeted. It's just like really broad. This does this. 
And then we basically run the ads and those ads don't have to be even profitable day one. What we're looking for here is the softer metrics where we can see, okay, angle one avatar three is like, you know, this is miles ahead of everything, which could be, you know, whatever that angle and avatar is. From there, then we can start to tailor the messaging on the sales page and begin working on advertorial that's exactly like these ads. And these ads aren't long form. They're like, they're not... Um, your typical e-com ads, they're still story based, but they're only 45 to one minute long. And they follow, the way you want to do it is you want to follow the same structure where it's like hook, agitate, problem, solution, whatever you want to come up with. But you just want to make sure to keep that structure the exact same across all of these angle and avatar tests, because you want to be testing one variable at a time. And that variable is the angle of the avatar. Otherwise, if you've got different structures, it could be the structure that's not working. Yeah. So when we do this, we come up with the story around this angle and avatar. Then we write the avatorial for that, and then we tailor the, the messaging across the sales page. So that's the first step, if it's brand new. If we're launching where we have tons of ads now, we'll do the same thing. We will have, um, if we're launching a new concept, for example, um, one could be they want to avoid surgery for back pain. Um, another angle could be, you know, someone who can't sleep due to back pain. So obviously if we run a, a VSL or a video ad talking about avoiding surgery and someone just has, they can't sleep because of the back pain, there's a message mix match there. Mm. So what we'll do is we're launching new ads like that. First, we'll test them to the sales page to, gen to see, okay, what are the metrics looking like? And if they're good, then we'll write the advertorial. So we don't just go writing a bunch of advertorials. Uh, unless we validate it first, you know? Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think that's a really sensible way to do it. And it's really interesting to hear about the method that you've worked out to be able to do that. At the start, did you start by building out the advertorials, then realize how much time you were wasting? Or did you always have this kind of method? In no, place? I definitely didn't, man. I didn't even understand concepts and angles. I just, yeah. it was very new to it. So I was just like writing what I thought was good. And basically what I did at the start, which actually kind of I learned the most from was I was just rewriting like uh, these affiliate network advertorials. So it was mm. just like, okay, what does this headline say? And I change it for our product. Um, and I feel like, you know, I do copywriting, but I'm in no way a copywriter. You know, there's some guys that are just copywriters that would just blow you away. Yeah. Um, so I tend to stick to like proven frameworks. I learn a lot from other people that are actually genuinely really good copywriters. And I just use that framework tailored to our messaging. Um, what was the question, sorry? Slipped my mind as well now. <laughs> did, did, did it always oh, yeah. start sorry. that way? Like, did you have this kind of built out process yeah. or is it, has it been that natural progression? Yes, yeah. no, it was natural progression yeah. for sure. Like when we started, even up until the start of this year, it was kind of very like, okay, we'll write it. Oh, I think this, I'd come up, I'd find some bit of research somewhere that was such a cool story that I was like, this is going to crush. And I just write an advertorial, story-based advertorial on it. We'd launch ads to it and it would just flop because mm. it was just like, you know, completely shooting from the hip. There was no yeah. kind of methodology to it. See, I wonder how many people would do that and then go, advertorials don't work. Yeah. But it's because they've not done well, one, all of the research on the Facebook forms, the Reddit forms, all of the testing, I think people are too quick to say that a particular method doesn't work until they've actually cracked it. One thing that you said that you're moving on to this year that you want to try and crack is Taboola. Now, I'm cautious that we've gone like way into advertising and maybe not shared um, some of the recent things that you've kind of been through. Is Was there any more to the journey that led to launching the brand before we go off on a tangent with Taboola? The, our current brand, yeah. So it was basically, again, we were running up, like I said, we did that skincare thing and we we were running tons of stuff up there. We had an amazing Q4 then after we did a couple of mil um, and like things were really good. And then I decided to launch a brand uh, in the skincare niche where I was custom, custom building, getting all the formulations made and wasted like two or three months on that. Um, and didn't really have like, I, I thought this is going to be great. Like, you know, we're going to launch a skincare brand and it just ended up taking so much time back and forth, getting samples sent to Ireland, making sure the product was good. Wasted like two or three months. And then I was just like, oh, look, I'm just going to launch a brand, but I'm going to do it with a product that exists already that we can then just make better. But I, did, I wanted to get out of that drop shipping, you know, yeah. just testing different products. Month to month, we could have different stores. It's the longest store we had probably was three months or something, you know. So I wanted to build something more long-term with the idea of, to make money, but also to exit. Um, but the main thing was, you know, it has to be profitable front end. It wasn't just like, just an exit play. So we decided to shift into the pain relief niche because again, it's like, you know, it's easy to use this direct response stuff with pain relief products. 
Um, and that's where we went from there. I found a product that wasn't really, no one was really selling at the time. There was lot, tons of products that did the same thing, but this particular one wasn't there. So we just launched it. I started by doing the exact process I just spoke about where we did the angle avatar matrix and we, we were successful like nearly straight away. And we scaled up, I think the first month we did like 150K. It was just like profitable straight away. Um, and that was pretty much it. We we had no real road bumps, you know, ups and downs of Facebook and stuff like that. But since then, that was just like, it kind of took off. I think you had enough road bumps along the way to to get them over and done with, didn't you? Yeah, 100%. But are there any things that you're kind of facing at the moment? I think, mean, is it true what they say, more money, more problems? Are the problems just getting bigger? Or is, is it at the point now where, you know, like you said, you're climatized to that level of stress that it's just, it's just the day to day? Definitely different problems and yeah. um, different problems. Like for example, now it, it, like I'm really, really impulsive. And I think it's a bit more managing yourself than, than the business because I'm super impulsive and it kind of got me from where I was to where I am now, but it, it's definitely what limits going any further because every time we scale up to the, the big numbers, like it, I, I'm all over the place because I'm just kind of like, yeah, launch this, do this, do this. Whereas I've had to really look and say like, okay, I am actually the bottleneck, but just by not making calculated decisions, just like there's, there's different types of decisions, decisions you can be super like, okay, just go for it. And then other decisions where you have to be quite calculated because it's not just a monetary cost, it's time costs, mm. all this other stuff. So now we've actually, we're, we're holding steady and we're focusing really on building out our processes because it's one thing we really lacked was clear processes that everyone knew. So the business would run smooth because as we got busy, and the pressure was put on the team, I ended up jumping in here and there. And I, I'd never really explained, because every, a lot of this comes from my head, I'd never really explained how things were meant to be done. And I just hired, expected people to know what I knew. You know what I mean? Mm. So that's one of our biggest things now is kind of just really getting building a company rather than me being just the entrepreneur trying to do everything. Um, and it's definitely difficult for me. I'm definitely not a, I'm, I'm not naturally a process driven person. You know what I mean? And we have yeah. a great COO now who's really helping with this. But, um, yeah, that, they're the sort of problems we're dealing with now. We, we can get up to scale, there's no problem. But it's actually when we're there, I'm crazy. I'm like, I'm not sleeping. I'm trying to do everything. There's tons of fires to put out every day that I can't focus on doing what I do best, you know? Yeah. When you're saying about not sleeping, there's one thing I wanted to add there because you just jobbed to my memory about how you said you had some of your best months to date and you were managing the ads and you were spending so much on your daily budget that you had to get up every two hours throughout the night to check that the ads were performing so that you know you had enough time to turn it off if it was just blown through budget so are you still running the ads i'm still i'm not launching ads i'm i'm doing scaling but like what you just said there like when you yeah. say it back to him like that makes no sense you know what i mean if you were to tell somebody like why are you doing that yeah. you know there's you can get facebook media buyers they're not hard to find yeah. um but yeah man like we were doing like a million, two million in a month. And I was up, we'd launch a new budget, a new campaign for say 30K and we'd have three of them going. So it could be potentially 90 grand worth of spend going out that day. Now we'd kill two of them, but like I would get up and then I'd go to bed at 12, say I'd wake up at 2 a.m. to check because if something was performed bad, you turn it off. And at that budget, if you turn, a bu turn an ad off, Facebook will still spend, they can still blow through 4K or 5K before the ad actually stops running. Mm. So like I was having Twitches, like it was all over the place. Like yeah. I was making the most amount of money I've ever made, but it was probably the unhappiest I'd been in years. Yeah, you gave gave up your piece for Yeah, completely, for that. completely. Was that last year? Are we, were we talking about last year? Last year wasn't as bad. I had a, a team last year. Yeah. Uh, the year before that was when we, that that was the worst time. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, just, I was doing everything. We were doing 100K per day at one point and I had me, two VAs and a video editor. That was it. I think when we met for coffee last week, something you said kind of really stuck with me because it's something that I've done recently. You mentioned about for a very long time, you did as much as you could for as long as you could until you absolutely needed to hire. And that's what me and my business partner did as well. And then Q4 last year, when things really ramped up, we were like, oh, we need, we, you know, we need to hire, we need to get staff on. And now what I feel like we've done is what you described as like buying back your time. So I'm like, okay, if we've bought back our time, now we need to really leverage our time, which is why we've now got like the paid ad funnel up, we're prospecting, we're trying to bring in more business. It's like really everything we're doing should be geared towards growth now. So that kind of really stuck with me because I know there's a lot of people that will hire as quick as they can or, you know, try and systemize this process, systemize that. Sometimes I think you've just got to kind of figure it out. And once you've got everything in a position, 
to be able to hire the right people and you've got enough budget there to be able to fund it and everything's in position and ready to go, then maybe that's the right time to hire. Would you agree or as someone who's done a lot yourself, when would you say is the right time to hire? I think it depends on the role, you know, like I've been told since I, I've joined a couple of different masterminds, all with people who are crushing it and doing crazy numbers and have been for years. And the advice was always hire top down, mm. hire top down, hire the managers first. And it's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like that's easy for you to say, but really that's the, the first person you should be probably getting is someone who can help you do, if you're not good with operations, is someone who can help you build these operations. Because what's going to happen is you're going to hire a bunch of people. There's going to be no operations there. And it's just a mess that has to be cleaned up. Yeah. I think, like obviously get the first things in e-commerce anyway, get the first things out of the way, get customer support. You don't want to be reading angry emails. No one's emailing you happy stuff, yeah. you know? <laughs> so get that off your plate because that's just negative and it's going to like take up so much time. So get the customer support sorted so that, you know, it's functional and it's get ahead of customer support then you can promote from within. Um, video, I feel like, you know, it's, it's a great skill to have, but it's also not one you should be doing as the business owner. Um, I feel like get that off your plate. Facebook ads nowadays, if you have a dialed in funnel, you have good creative, it, there's not much work to it from, even if you're doing 100, 200K per month, there, there isn't much work in it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't worry about that. After that probably would be like some sort of operations manager if I was to go back mm -hmm. and pay for them, pay well. Don't get someone who sucks. Get someone who's, you know, has experience um, and understands, preferably understands e-commerce, the way that business works and get them to build the operations right from the start. Because what we're having to do now is complete opposite. We're yeah. having to unfuck a lot of the stuff that I have done and re like th this is how our staff is used to working. And now yeah. it's a whole like you have to flip it and they're doing things differently. And there's a whole learning process there as well. So I'd probably go operations next and then allow the company to expand like that. But yeah, it's funny. Like I was always told higher top down, but it was just like, always tried to get cheaper talent. And then yeah. I said, yeah, but I can train them myself. Yeah. It's not the way you want to do it. Yeah, I had some advice recently, which was to, um, rather than train the individual, build the process and build the SOP for them to follow. So that if for whatever reason they're gone tomorrow, you can get someone in that can then follow that process. Yeah, 100%. But, like you say, I think it's difficult to run your business a certain way and then try and implement a ton of processes. And that's kind of what we're doing at the moment. Because it was just me and my business partner for so long, a lot of what we were doing was was up here in our heads. And then all of a sudden, you know, we were a team of six and we're expecting them to do things the way that we do things and they're not. And so we're like, you know, we've got everything in Airtable now, we're building out all of these SOPs and just trying to get everyone on the same page, but it's difficult, especially as they've been with us eight weeks now and a lot of these are new processes that we're implementing. So I can only imagine how that can be difficult at scale with a business like yours. Um, how did you find hiring? Because hiring is a sort of thing where you don't get much um, practice, right? Like, and you could hire someone and it might take a few months, like a couple of months for them to really settle in unless they are like, like you say, top down, I guess maybe they'd probably be able to come in and take over straight away. But for the people that I've hired, it takes like a little bit of time getting them in, training them on the processes or, you know, getting them up to scratch. And hiring is just not something you do regularly. So I've found it to be quite a difficult process where you throw yourself in at the deep end and you've got to be quick to learn because those, those kind of decisions or the people you bring in can make, make or break your business, you know? Yeah, man, there's a lot in this. Like, again, as I said, if you'd hired your, an operations manager first for me, that's you can allow them to go and do the hiring. Um, but I've definitely made massive mistakes with hiring where I kind of just filled positions as they came up with people who probably weren't qualified. Um, and like, we've had it in the company where like one bad hire can really mess things up. Yeah. Um, like, and especially when they're communicating in, internally with other people and like the bad vibe there can just rub off on other people. And it's very hard to get rid of. Like even when you get rid of that person, that kind of lingers. And we had that a while ago with some editors that we had and it really messed stuff up for us. Um, what the way we hire now is, is way differently. So before it was like online jobs and um, going through tons of interviews because there's so many people who say you can do, they'll promise you the world, but they'll mm. never really fulfill it. But we kind of just like to use LinkedIn and kind of just go to companies that are bigger than us or doing, we're doing bigger things than us or they're a bit ahead of us and just like approach them and say like, you know, hey, you open to new opportunities. A lot of time we'll get a message back. No, thanks. I'm, I'm happy where I am. Or yeah, can you tell me a bit more about it? Mm. So we've had two really good hires now in the last, this year have been really, really good and both from LinkedIn rather than online jobs. Also met a guy over here, a recruiter. Um, 
and that's taken so much stress off us. Like he's, we just message him. This is what, exactly what we want. And you can be as detailed as possible. You, I want a Facebook media buyer who has experience with funnels, who knows creatives, who can use motion, who can do this, that, and the other, mm. who can do, you know, 10, 100 push-ups, whatever. <laughs> and this guy will find them. You know what I mean? It takes it off your plate. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And then he'll pre-vet them as well. So you're not wasting your time. The biggest thing with the hiring was wasting time. You get on yeah. call and go straight away, this guy can't even speak English. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. So we've talked now about kind of your journey um, leading up to the point where you have the company that's today. Took a bit of a deep dive on uh, <laughs> advertorials, which I think we'll probably lose a lot of people on that in that we've kind of gone a bit deep into e but it's great. I I've enjoyed it. Um, copywriting, hiring. So now what I'm curious of is like, what does your day-to-day -day look, uh, look like? Because you're also a father, right? Yep. So on top of having a business that you're aiming to do 20 mil in revenue, all of these day-to-day -day problems, which we've barely even scraped the surface on, you know, some of the things that you face on a daily basis, being in Dubai, then the Bali, um, sorry, Bali, a lot of traveling. How do you fit in your day-to-day -day around all of that? Yeah, man, the most important thing I think is like, you need to, for me anyway, I need to just get a deep work block done. Like you can get us so much done. If you take four hours in a day, like it's funny, if I'm not doing deep work, I can get done in four hours what I would get done in two days. You know what I mean? So just really prioritizing that. Um, I like to train preferably early, get that over and done with, and then come back and just lock in. Um, and get the amount of work you can get done in four hours, especially if you've planned really well. So it's all really about planning exactly what you have to execute on because there's always like in my head like you said shiny object syndrome i know exactly what we have to do and what we have to execute on this year to get to where we want to go but some of it isn't ready to be executed on and it's like trying to pull myself back from like focusing on for example like taboola ads we've we done that when we're in, we still have so much to do on meta so mm. we actually pulled back from that just loads of stuff like that if you can really look at what the biggest levers are right now not in two months time not in two weeks time and see this is the biggest lever we can pull right now and putting all of your focus on that yeah. rather than wasting time distracted on like smaller stuff. As long as you're constantly ticking those off the list, you'll still get momentum. You know what I mean? You can travel, you can do, you, you can have more time. You just need to know exactly what levers are meant to be worked on at the time. Yeah, for sure. I think that's key. I think that would be one of the biggest takeaways from this conversation. It's something I often have to remind myself. Like I had a conversation with my business partner yesterday on reflection of, all of the people I've met this past week, one of them being you, but also, you know, uh, the guys from Life Like Media, Adam Power. Um, I also met another guy that I've been in touch with out here um, who's super, super successful. And I said to my business partner yesterday, I was like, it's been a bit of like a, an emotional week for me because there's just so much success. There's like an abundance of wealth here. And what would consider to be doing well back where I'm from yeah, in the we UK, were really saying this the other you're day. like the bottom of the pile and you're just listening to all these people and what they do and, and yourself being one of them, you know, the challenges that you've been through and the resilience that you've got and where you've got to and obviously so deserving of being there. It just made me really sort of reflect on everything that I'm doing. And it, it, it's like, am I doing something wrong here? You, you have this massive inflection point and I, I really analyzed everything that I was doing. And it was probably one of the best things that I did because I see so clearly now everything that I need to do. And you know, I have it almost every few weeks normally, like this light bulb moment, and it's kind of like gets me back in line about what I actually need to do to, like you said, the lever that's going to move the business the most. And um, yeah, I had to get my business partner on a call to just kind of share with him and reflect on the week that I've had and what I'm seeing. And I think uh, I'm just keeping in mind that you become a product of those that you surround yourself with, right? So I see what everyone else is doing. And as much as it's like, why am I not there yet? It's like, well, what better place to learn than from all of these people that in all successful in their own right with all these different business models. I think if there's one thing I've learned is it doesn't matter what you're doing. All these business models work. You just need to, like you've said, know which things you need to do that are actually going to give you the greatest gain. Um, so I think that would be like a really good kind of takeaway for everyone that's watched this podcast. And I feel like an hour maybe wasn't long enough to actually go over all of the things that you had to share, but was, is there anything that you would maybe add to that? Again, I know it's a little bit broad because we've touched on your journey, honed in on a few specific things, but maybe to other e-commerce businesses out there, uh, aside from hiring and maybe the ads in the day-to-day, -day, you know, is there any, any key takeaways that you'd share with anyone? Yeah, man, I think going back to pulling the right levers, it's the most important thing because 
like as as you said over here you meet so many people doing crazy crazy things and like I don't know about you but a lot of time you meet them go this is just a normal guy there yeah. is some outliers that are just you know you go this guy's a genius like yeah. but most people are just normal guys you know what I mean and they're yeah. doing 10x the revenue 10 like they, they're just not they're not 10x better humans than you you know what I mean yeah and you just look at them and just they just execute on the things that are meant to be executed on at that time, all the time. And the thing is, it might not be over the space of a month, you might not notice, but you have to get to the end of the year and, and draw out. Like if you had pulled all the right levers in the right order, at the end of the year, you'd be exponentially further. You're not going to notice the day to day. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm just doing an email. I have to go back to this. I have to go back to that. They literally will draw your time out. If you just focus and get the right things done over the space of the year, the amount of progress you're going to run people out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're just going to outpass everyone. If the, the standard or the average person, like, and I fall into it a bit, I have to check my email, I have to do that. And you just do busy work. Whereas yeah. if you can just really get that four hour block and pre, pre-plan pre it, you know, you're just going to, you're going to take off. Yeah, 100%. Forget all the noise. That's pull it. up pull up that Google calendar, <laughs> schedule it out. I mean, I'd do it. I was doing it this morning. Um, it really does help. Um, no, I think that's really, really important. So Harvey, You've shared with us kind of your journey from going from the owning a car garage to hopefully projecting to do 20 mil in rev this year. Some of the ups and downs in between. I think we only really managed to scrape the surface. I think if we'd gone a bit deeper, there's probably so many things that happened along that way that you could have shared. But all of the different businesses that you've built along the way, all the different stores, the different products, how you've become so wise within e-commerce, even though I know you're very humble and you'll probably think there's so much more I need to learn. But I think for everyone watching, it's an incredible story. Um, would have loved to dive a bit deeper on some things, but we can maybe save that for another day. 100%. But I want to say thank you very much for coming on. Um, you're very, very deserving of where you are. If anyone watches this and doesn't think that you deserve to be where you are, then uh, I don't know what they're listening to. Um, but yeah, best of luck to you. I really hope you hit that goal. I'm confident that you will. And uh, hopefully next time we talk, you can tell me about how you got to that 20 million. 100%, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having me. me. Thank you.